lifespan development of the brain and behavior. So let's go ahead and get started. As much fun as this is going to be. There you go. Uh, the brain contains about 100 billion neurons and an equal number of glial cells. It's estimated that there may be as many as 100 trillion connections within the brain. And uh, I read something the other day. It said there are as many uh, connections in your brain as there are stars in the sky. Uh, while genetics play an important role in creating the brilliant creatures that each and every one of us may be, the environment guides the process of development. The most rapid brain growth is during gestation, but it continues to expand markedly through the language acquisition years. For an egg to be fertilized and come to term, everything has to be perfect. The sperm must have its full complement of 23 chromosomes and will not be able to swim through the cervix, up through the uterus, and into the fallopian tube to penetrate the ova unless it is perfect. And that is the, 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 uh, the route that it has to take. It has to go through the cervix. Now, normally the cervix is closed off. Uh, it has a mucal plug. Uh, and uh, it's only during ovulation that the cervix actually opens up. So it has to go through the cervix, it has to swim through the uterus, and it has to get to the fallopian tube when the ova is in the fallopian tube in order for the, uh, for the ova to be uh, penetrated and uh, for the um, um, fertilization process to take place. The ova must have its full complement of 23 chromosomes and be in the right position when the sperm reaches it, and, and that position is usually uh, in the fallopian tube. For implantation to take place, the uterine wall must be ready for implantation. Uh, the zygote, and of course, uh, those of you who are female understand what the, uh, the ready is. Uh, that is the, uh, the, the period that you have at the uh, uh, monthly, uh, is the pr actually the uh, preparation uh, for implantation of an ova uh, for a zygote, for a uh, fertilized egg. Uh, the, the uterine wall uh, uh, accumulates uh, tissue and, uh, and blood, and uh, that is what makes the uterus uh, ready for implantation. And uh, if, the, uh, if there, the zygote does not implant itself on the uterine wall, then the uterine wall will slough off, and all of that, uh, that uh, tissue and uh, blood will... Um, run out of the individual, and that is your monthly menstrual, menstrual period. The zygote must implant near the top of the uterus. Adequate vascularization must take place between the embryo and the uterus. Growth and cell division must take place in a continual and balanced pattern. As soon as the sperm penetrates the ova, the structure becomes a zygote. Within 12 hours, the single cell will divide into two cells. Uh, within two weeks, the zygote becomes an embryo and divides into three distinct layers. The nervous system develops from the outer layer of the three, uh, the, of the three layers, and this is known as the ectoderm. The ectoderm grows into a flat oval plate. Uh, the cells of the plate do not grow at the same rate, and a groove will develop. And this is the groove developing right here. There you go and then it will fold itself over. This groove is known as the primitive streak. As the cell, cells continue to divide, the groove slowly grows into a neural tube, and this is the way it happens. Uh, oops, I don't know how, yeah, here's how we're going, there we go, and there's your neural tube, and that will become your spinal column, and your hindbrain, your midbrain, your forebrain. Uh, the front of the interior portion of the tube divides into three structures that will become the hindbrain, and the midbrain, and the forebrain, and the rest of it becomes the spinal cord. By the eighth week, uh, the gestation of gestation, the, the fetus will develop all of the rudimentary organs in its body. The organ at this time takes up uh, one half of the fetus's mass. Uh, the brain will continue to grow through the teenage years, and of course, as you can see, it's about half the size of the entire uh, structure. 
Nervous system development takes place in six stages. The first stage is neurogenesis, the formation of the neurons. Uh, cell migration will take place, movement of the neurons uh, to form nerve cell populations. Uh, differentiation, development of the distinctive types of, the neur of neurons. Synaptogenesis, a development of synaptic connections as axon and dendrites grow. Neuronal cell death, uh, selective death of neurons. If that neuron is not perfect, uh, then it will, uh, it will destroy itself. Uh, and you're not going to have something that's imperfect. And then synapse rearrangement, uh, uh, refinement of synaptic connections. All of these take place in this order. Neurogenesis, formation of the neurons. Uh, the neurons will migrate uh, and form cell populations. The cell populations will differentiate uh, to different types of neurons. Synaptogenesis will take place where the, uh, the synapses are formed. Uh, axons and dendrites will grow together. Um, if the, like I said before, if the neuron isn't perfect, uh, then it will, will uh, self-destruct uh, a process known as apoptosis. But we'll talk about that in just a moment. And then, of course, uh, the synaptic uh, connections will, will become refined so that we become the brilliant creatures that we will become, that we end up as. <laughs> the first stage of nurse, nerve system development is neurogenesis. Uh, this is when the nerve cells are produced. Uh, nerve cells themselves do not divide, but the pre-nerve cells, which are located in the inner layer of the neural tube, do divide and create a closely, closely packed layer of cells called the ventricular zone. And this is a ventricular zone right here. And this is what they look like initially. They are dividing at this point, and they are becoming masses. And this is how, how it looks. The cells of the ventricular zone continue to divide and give rise to daughter cells, which also divide. All the body's neurons and glial cells are derived from ventricular mitosis. Mitosis just means it uh, divides and forms two. Uh, neural cells will be uh, completely developed by birth. Uh, each neural structure in the brain will develop at the same time in gestation for all humans. And this is the reason why uh, gestation takes nine months. Uh, this is a, a process that, uh, that everyone will go through. Um, it is, uh, it, it's a time situation. So no matter what, what's going on, if the mother's a drinker and she's killing the baby's brain cells, um, then as we have seen, I think we've seen it in this class, uh, if someone is born with uh, FAS, with fetal alcohol syndrome, uh, their brain isn't as large as, a, uh, as a, an individual that, that develops normally. Neurons of the developing nervous system are always on the move. During the cell migration stage, the cells of the ventricular layer begin to move where they will end up. In humans and other primates, by birth, all of the neuronal cells will have found their way to where they will always be. Some neurons will creep down glial cells, known as radial glial cells, and this is how they find out where they're going to end up. Neurons can either move down the glial cells or jump from one to the next. This migration is guided by various chemicals called cell adhesion molecules. The cere uh, cerebrum is formed by wave after wave of neurons till the entire cerebral cortex is formed. And of course, it's the cerebral cortex that gives humans their uh, enormous uh, intellect. Once the preneuronal cells reach their destination, genes in the cells begin to make the proteins that are required by neurons. At this point, the neurons uh, begin differentiating into the distinctive neurons of the region that they are in. And what, so why do they uh, produce this protein? They produce this protein because they are told that this is where they're going to be. And this is what they're going to do. Most neuronal cells differentiate through induction. They take on the task of all the neighboring cells. And then they start producing the protein because, you know, because their neighbors are, 
are creating are, uh, are creating the protein, they will create the protein as well. Some cells are undifferentiated cells and will differentiate into any cells that they are close to. And these are known as stem cells. And so when you read about stem cell research, that's what they're talking about. Stem cells are cells that are undifferentiated and can form, if you put them close to uh, a heart muscle, uh, then they will form a heart muscle. If you put them uh, uh, in the uh, spinal column, uh, they will form uh, more cells in the spinal column uh, <clears throat> or brain cells or whatever. When neurons migrate to their final destination, they start the process of synaptogenesis. Axon and dendrites begin to web out, uh, making contact with the cells that they are going to be responding to. This is done through swollen ends of dendrites and axons called growth cones. The growth cones reach out using fine filaments, uh, and this is known as filopodia, or plates, and that's known as lamellopodia, and of course, a phila, phila, a filopodia uh, that has to do with uh, long strings and the plates are flat uh, uh, structures that, uh, that will reach out and uh, make contact with whatever they need to make contact with. Growth cones are drawn uh, by chemical signals called chemoattractants. Uh, growth cones can also be repelled by chemical signals called chemorepellents. As adults, we maintain synaptogenesis structures, dendritic growth cones, axonic uh, chemo, uh, chemo attractants, and chemo repellents. And of course, uh, if we're learning a new skill like um, uh, batting a uh, baseball, uh, then, then uh, when we do it a couple times, after we do it a couple times, we have created in our brains the uh, the structure the uh, the neurons that tell us how to swing the bat and when to swing the bat uh, have taken uh, have uh, been recreated in the brain uh, through chemical attractants and now we have muscle memory and where did that muscle memory come from that muscle memory came from these uh, neurons that uh, have tied themselves together so that we can do this over and over and over again. Synapses uh, can form rapidly on dendrites and dendritic spines. The number of spines increase rapidly after birth and are affected by experience. And the experience, uh, the, uh, the number of times you need to do something to, uh, to remember it is uh, it's the magic number three. So if you do th things three times, if you look in, if you read something three times, you will remember it because it's stuck in your brain and can't get out. Uh, if you're practicing something, uh, doing a layup uh, in basketball or, or hitting a baseball, uh, if you do it three times, then the third time it will be stuck there and you'll be able to do it. You just need to practice it at least three times. Three is the magic number. It's interesting. Some people can learn things in one or two, uh, but uh, normally uh, it takes about three. And once you've done it uh, three times, that's, that's it. Neuronal cell death, apoptosis, is crucial to brain development, especially during the embryonic stages. Neuronal cell death ranges from 20 to 80 percent, varying from region to region of the brain and spinal cord. An area needs only uh, so uh, many neurons and synapses, sees, uh, and as the area grows, more neurons than are needed flood into the area to ensure that the most perfect neuronal structure and synapse are created. The cells that die are self-selecting to die. They are committing suicide. So if it's not perfect, it goes away. And those cells will go away. And that's okay. That's the way it's supposed to be. The reason that we are as perfect as we are, as brilliant as we are, is because the cells that, uh, that were uh, incomplete uh, uh, killed themselves. They, they went away. Actually, they, they uh, self-destructed, and all of the, uh, the substances uh, that they are made up of uh, went back in and, uh, to create more uh, neuro neurons and more synapses. All cells carry a death gene that causes a sudden influx and release of calcium ions. 
that uh, causes the mitochondria uh, to release a protein called Diablo. Now, if you know your Spanish, then you know Diablo means the devil. Uh, Diablo binds uh, the inhibitors of apoptosis proteins, the IAPs, that have been inhibiting uh, a family of proteins called caspases. The caspases are proteases or enzymes that dissolve protein. The caspases break down the protein and the DNA of the neuron. Normally, Diablo is inhibited by BCL2. Cells that are able to uh, make proper and adequate synaptic connections are the ones that live, while those that don't die rather than make a poor connection. Uh, chemicals that enable proper growth are called neurotropic factors, and so that's how apoptosis works. Uh, the uh, calcium ions cause the mitochondria to release a protein called Diablo. The Diablo binds with uh, IAPs, and that uh, will release the uh, caspases. And the caspases will break down the protein of the cell, and it will be gone. But, of course, if you have BCL2, if it's a perfect connection, then the Diablo will, will be inhibited. And this is a joke. Integrating signal sending to his obsolescence, George undergoes apoptosis and his head explodes. That's, of course, not possible. This is something that's taking place at a micro level, not a macro level. <clears throat> Scientists have discovered a substance that promotes the growth of spinal ganglia that they call nerve growth factor. If a technique could be developed to use NGF, uh, effectively, spinal injuries could be repaired back to normal function, but of course, that hasn't happened yet. With time and experience, some synapses disengage and other synapses are formed. This process is especially prevalent during cell death in the area, refining the remaining uh, synapses uh, to pro uh, provide optimum connections. While neurons and glial cells develop from the same source cells, scientists don't know what informs the cells to end up as one or the other. While neuronal growth takes place almost exclusively before birth, glial cells have their greatest growth surge right after birth and continue to grow throughout life. The glial cells provide myelin for the axons of the neuron. The myelin protects, feeds, and accelerates the electrical response on the neuron. Myelination allows people to walk with coordination and the brain to process information rapidly. Multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease that affects uh, select individuals. The condition allows the immune system to attack the myelin of the neurons and leave gaps in the structure that slows the neuronal response and eventually, of course, they lose the ability to move. Now, strangely enough, about 70% of all autoimmune diseases are affect uh, females. Um, we're not exactly sure why, but one of the reasons is be, maybe because uh, females have a, a stronger immune system than men. And since uh, the uh, uh, cells are being destroyed by the immune system, it's an autoimmune disease, a self-immune disease, uh, then women are more susceptible to, to the autoimmune diseases, such as arthritis, uh, lupus, um, multiple sclerosis. Uh, they're just more susceptible. Intrinsic factors in the development of the nervous system deal with uh, genetic factors that allow for proper development. When genetic aberrations occur, it can cause abnormal uh, brain development. Tay-Sachs disease causes the destruction of neurons that eventually results in death. It has been in identified as a flaw on the 15th chromosome. Down syndrome causes intellectual disability and body abnormalities. It has been identified as an extra chromosome on the 21st pair. So we're looking at flaws and extra chromosomes causing a lot of problems. Extrinsic factors include malnutrition, fetal alcohol syndrome, hypoxia-induced intellectual disability, 
the hypoxia induced uh, hypoxia means not uh, not getting enough oxygen. Uh, this can happen at birth if the baby doesn't come uh, through the birth canal uh, rapidly enough. Um, normally, and and if the uh, the uh, blood supply is cut off, normally the bo the the baby is getting its oxygen through its umbilical cord. If that um umbilical cord gets tied, uh, sometimes it'll tie uh, uh, wrap itself around the uh, the baby's uh, neck. Uh, if that happens, then the blood flow can be uh, cut off, and uh, the oxygen flow will uh, be decreased to the brain. And this is the hypoxia that we're primarily talking about. Uh, now normally this used to happen all the time or it used to happen far more frequently than it does today uh, but we have ways of, uh, of visualizing what's going on with the baby uh, as it's coming through the birth canal. Uh, so this isn't, uh, isn't that common now. Uh, it does still happen of course. Uh, if uh, there was a problem with the, uh, with the, uh, the baby uh, they would probably take the baby by cesarean section. And that way, of course, uh, since the, uh, the umbilical cord wouldn't be stressed, uh, the baby would uh, be able to be born without any problems. So there's a lot of different reasons why they, they take a baby uh, through cesarean section. Uh, if there's any, uh, any hint uh, that there is a, is potentially going to be a problem if the baby is born uh, vaginally, then uh, they'll take it uh, cesarean. <clears throat> the sum of the intrinsic factors are referred to as the genotype. Uh, the genotype uh, plus the extrinsic factors represent an individual's phenotype. And we used to see this all the time. Uh, I, I was uh, I was a lab tech, and one of the, our jobs was cross-matching cross -matching blood. And of course, the, uh, the, you could always tell uh, the, uh, the phenotype because that's the blood type. Uh, but if the, the hidden type was uh, the one that, that wasn't represented by the, uh, uh, by the, by the blood uh, type, and uh, that's what you were, you were looking for. You were looking for a problem in the genotype. The phenotype's no problem because you just give them, if it, they've got O positive blood, then you give them O positive blood. Everything should be fine. But the genotype is uh, blood factors that are hidden. And that's what you, we would have to look for uh, when we were cross-matching blood. We'd have to look for uh, uh, problems um, that uh, were, were hidden. And uh, it's, it was really kind of fascinating. Sometimes you would find things that you're, you're going, wait a minute, uh, we have, I have two uh, A-positive uh, blood, blood samples here, the, the mother's blood and the, and the donor's blood. What's, what the, what's the problem? And it would always be a problem in the genotype. That has to match. And this is one of the reasons why you can't just transplant. Somebody's got a, a kidney, you've got to make sure that uh, the kidney matches. And what you're looking at is uh, you're looking at the phenotype and the genotype. Phenotype's easy. Uh, otherwise, you could just match, uh, you know, an O positive kidney with, a, with an O positive uh, donor, and you got no problems. But uh, the genotype is, the, is all the hidden factors. It's all the hidden um, uh, things that, uh, that, that cause, can potentially cause a problem. And this is one of the reasons, you know, the DNA has to match up. And that's why uh, it is not that easy to find a, uh, a donor uh, for someone. It isn't just finding a kidney, it's finding a kidney that matches. When mutations take place in a species, genetic history, the mutation most often creates a maladaptive circumstance. And otherwise, uh, otherwise the mutation, <laughs> in other words, the mutation causes the, the uh, individual to uh, uh, not survive. It's a maladaptive circumstance in, in, in the vast majority of mutations. Now, there, of course, there are mutations that, uh, that uh, are, don't cause any problems, like blue eyes. Uh, the assumption is uh, that blue eye, the blue-eyed mutation started about 10,000 years ago. 
Uh, so the first blue-eyed people were born 10,000 years ago. And it was a mutation, but it didn't hurt anything. And since it didn't hurt anything, and it, since it didn't cause the death of the individual, uh, then that blue-eyed person was able to survive. And then, of course, that blue-eyed person uh, reproduced, and then we had more blue-eyed people. Uh, so, and that's the way it worked. Now, you got to think, well, we got one mutated uh, blue-eyed person. Let's say we have a blue-eyed female. Uh, well, all of her babies are going to have brown eyes because brown eyes, brown eyes are dominant over blue eyes. But uh, eventually, to somebody with uh, two, uh, blue eye, two blue eyes, uh, wait a minute, <laughs> so they're, uh, they're uh, heterozygous, they're not homozygous. They're, we've got a homozygous brown-eyed person having uh, reproducing with a uh, homozygous blue-eyed person. So all of their babies are going to have one blue-eyed gene and one brown-eyed gene. So if now, in order to pr reproduce another blue-eyed person, we're, what we're going to have to do is have two heterozygous uh, brown-eyed, blue-eyed uh, individuals reproducing and one out of four of their children will have blue eyes. As weird as that sounds. <laughs> you're going to have one individual with, that is a brown-eyed uh, homozygous, and you're going to have two individuals that are uh, brown-eyed, blue-eyed uh, heterozygous, and you're going to have one individual with blue eyes. That's the way it works. One out of each, uh, out of four will will have blue eyes. And of course, that's how they have uh, uh, populated the earth with blue-eyed people. Not sure how many people in the world have blue eyes, but uh, it's, it's a relatively small percentage. It's not 50-50. But I have blue eyes, and my grandson has blue eyes. Experience is an important factor in, bra in brain development. The human brain is only one-fourth its adult size at birth, yet few new neurons are added. The reason for the exceptional growth is due to the dendrite growth and myelination. Dendrite growth and myelination are induced by experience with the various muscles and sensory organs of the body. <clears throat> and the more experience we have, the more dendrite growth we have. So, And that's one of the reasons why... Uh, when your baby was young, they told you to, um, uh, to, to allow the child to have uh, lots of experiences. To stimu to, they needed stimulation. The more stimulation they, ha they had, the more uh, uh, intelligent they would become uh, later on. So the more stimulation, the more uh, intelligent in the future. Why? Because it uh, creates dendritic growth and myelination. One form of extrinsic stimulation causing a problem is amblyopia. Also called walleye and lazy eye, children with the problem have a misalignment of the balance of their binocular vision. If left untreated by age 7 or 8, the, the suppressed eye will totally blind. In other words, this child, if they don't treat this, uh, this the fact that they have walleye, then they will go completely blind. Though this happened to, to one of my nieces. <clears throat> they this happened to one of my my great nieces I'm sorry uh, my niece would put her down watching television with a bottle and they would lie her down on on her one side on her on her right side and so she couldn't she wouldn't see anything out of her right eye she'd just be watching television with her left eye and she'd be drinking out of her, her bottle well, eventually what happened was that they created uh, a situation where the child had walleye because every time they put her down, uh, because my niece is, was lazy, uh, she would put her down and she would lay her down on her right side so, so that she could watch television. And it, it, uh, she almost went blind in her right eye, but she had walleye and they had to treat her for amblyopia. While treatment uh, in childhood will result in perfect vision, when the problem is corrected in adulthood, the eye does not gain acute vision. Now, the problem with my knee, my great niece, was that uh, they wouldn't admit that she had a problem. <laughs> so it took them a while to to uh, to start treating her. 
and now she has to wear glasses. That is a problem. Uh, this uh, is because when the problem is allowed to remain the same over time, the neural connections in the brain uh, from the weak eye are not as intricate. And that's what happened with my knees. Understanding of amblyopia and other asymmetrically balanced neural connections has been studied by performing binocular deprivation research on laboratory animals. And strangely enough, the animals that they chose to uh, cover one eye with a patch were cats. And that's how they discovered all of the uh, problems with, uh, with uh, unequal stimulation. Researchers have discovered that sensory organs have a sensitive period when the neural development is crucial for stimulation to induce proper dendritic connections. If stimulation does not occur by this time, recovery to a normal state is impossible. And that's what happened with the eye. To understand why people tend to have dominant eyes, it, it must be remembered that each eye represents millions of receptors vying for attention in the brain. When one eye receives more stimulation than the other, some of the synapses in the brain connected to the unstimulated eye will become weaker. While most uh, synapses do not fluctuate in their strength with stimulation, some do. These synapses are known as Hebbian synapses, the ones that are more dominant. 75 years ago, the leading cause of intellectual disability in the United States was phenylketonuria, or PKU. Phenylketonuria is a, oh, let me read this. Let me go through this and then I'll explain it. 2% of the population carries the recessive gene for phenylketonuria. The gene controls the enzyme that breaks down phenylalanine, an amino acid in protein. Because the enzyme does not break down the phenylalanine, a toxic level collects in the brain and it destroys brain cells. What the What is being uh, accumulated in the brain is the urea. Urea is, is uh, a waste product. So you get phenylketone urea, uh, which is a waste product of protein metabolism. And if this accumulates, it kills brain cells. Not in everybody's brain, of course, because only 2% of the population will carry the recessive gene uh, of, uh, of the uh, uh, the inability to break down phenylalanine. But if two of these individuals, two of these 2% of the population, get married, uh, then potentially one of their children will may potentially have phenylketonuria or PKU. Uh, they will not be able to break down their phenylketonuria. And now we got a really serious problem because this baby, if it uh, as soon as it starts drinking milk, which has protein in it, uh, to build... Uh, build all of their brain cells and their muscles uh, and their bones <clears throat> um, because they're drinking milk uh, and they can't break down the phenylketonuria, then it will cause a, uh, it will destroy brain cells and they will become, uh, they will have an intellectual deficit, which is sometimes fairly severe. 75 years ago, this was very common. So one of the first things that uh, I learned to do when I became a laboratory technician was draw blood from children, uh, from newborns, uh, in order to do the PKU test. And what you have to do is you have to draw enough blood so that you can uh, test their blood for an excess amount of PKU. And if you determine that, the, that they do have PKU in their blood, this substance that, that normally is broken down very readily in the, in the body, uh, then you start uh, giving, putting them on a special special diet. And if you can put them on a special diet soon enough, then uh, they will develop normally and not have any problem. But they are, they are phenylketonurics and will have to stay away from certain substances in order not to destroy their brain cells. So, yeah. So 75 years ago, uh, when we're, we're talking about... Uh, people with, uh, with problems, with intellectual deficits. Uh, the number one cause of intellectual deficits were, uh, phenol, was phenylketonuria. Williams syndrome is a relatively rare genetic abnormality that causes neural and facial abnormalities as well as 
mild intellectual disability. And this is the reason why uh, when you have a baby, uh, especially in a, uh, a city or in a hospital, uh, they will, one of the first things they do, as soon as the baby drinks milk, they will test the baby for phenylketonuria. The sooner they can get a hold of them, the sooner they can put them on a special diet. And this isn't very many uh, individuals uh, in the population. Uh, only about 2% of the population actually carries the recessive gene. That's not a whole lot. And two of them have to get together in order to create this child with the uh, PKU problem. Williams syndrome is a relatively rare genetic abnormality that causes neural and facial abnormalities as well as mild intellectual disability. Research indicates that Williams syndrome is caused by an incomplete chromosomal structure on the seventh chromosome. These individuals have normal linguistic ability, but difficulty in learning by observing. Individuals with Williams syndrome have very characteristic facial features. Uh, broad foreheads, small eye openings, uh, low nasal bridge, nostrils that point forward, a uh, long area between the nose and the upper lip, uh, full cheeks, and large downturned mouth. And as you can see, this is a child with uh, Williams syndrome. And if you look right here, this is a cerebellum. This is a, what a normal cerebellum looks like. This is what <clears throat> somebody with Williams syndrome, they, their cerebellum is at least twice as big. This is the part that, uh, that uh, has to do with your eyesight. This is where your eyesight takes place. You can see how, what it looks like in a uh, normal person. It's a much smaller area in the person with Williams syndrome. Everything else is about the same. Uh, but cerebellum is much larger in the person with Williams syndrome and the occipital lobe is much smaller. And this is what they look like. As you can see, they all look like relatives, but they're not. They're not related at all. They, are, they all have Williams syndrome. One of the interesting things about people with Williams syndrome, they are the, they they like everybody. <laughs> they, they never get mad. Uh, they're really pleasant people. They're always smiling, except for her. I don't know why she's not smiling. And they they look just like this. They uh, well, as you can see, they all look like they all look the same. Down syndrome is a condition caused by the uh, addition of an extra chromosome among the 21st pair of chromosomes, so they have trisomy 21. <clears throat> this abnormality can cause mild to severe intellectual disability and various physical anomalies, heart malformations, and brittle arteries that lead to a shortened life expectancy. Trisomy 21 is more prevalent in older women, probably because of the age of the ova. Research shows that individuals with trisomy 21 have abnormal formations of their dendritic spines, making it more difficult for these individuals to learn. And this is what trisomy 21 looks like when you do a DNA study of them. As you can see, everything is in pairs, half from the, the mother, half from the father, but they have trisomy 21. Whoops. Where's 23? The most frequent form of inherited intellectual disability today is fragile X syndrome, and this is what a fragile X looks like. As you can see, some of the, the, uh, the genetic material uh, is, uh, can break off uh, because it's, uh, it's right at the end and it's part of it uh, looks like it's going about to come off. The DNA of this select chromosome seems more pinched and fragile, more likely to break off, as I said before. The real problem seems to be an excessively uh, repeated trinucleotide that is an, in a, is an abundance four times normal, thus causing the extended appearance of the chromosome. The reality is this is an extra genetic material. And it's because of this uh, excessively repeated trinucleotide. That's why there are, are extra. This is what they look like. Uh, oddly, you know, a lot of these problems, uh, somebody with Down syndrome, somebody with Williams syndrome, somebody with uh, Fragile X, uh, they have a, a, a similar facial uh, structure.
this is these are this is a, a female with uh, with uh, fragile X. This is a, a male. They they these two individuals are in the same family. <clears throat> Um, their body structure is, is, is fairly normal. They have a broad forehead, elongated face, large prominent ears, as you can see. Is there a, yeah, large ears. Uh, strabismus, they have crossed eyes, a highly arched palate, which makes it difficult for them to speak. Uh, hyper extensible, extensive, uh, extensible joints, so they're, it's like they have all their joints are double jointed, uh, which means that uh, they can come out of uh, joint. Their joints separate fairly easily. Hand calluses from self abuse, it's from them rubbing their hands together. Pectus evac uh, uh, excavatum, uh, it means they have a concave uh, chest, uh, an indentation in their chest. Uh, mitral valve prolapse, uh, it's a benign heart condition. Uh, if it's a male, it's they have enlarged testicles, uh, hypotonia, uh, low muscle tone, uh, soft fleshy skin, flat feet, and uh, in about 10% of the cases, they will have epilepsy. They will have seizures. About 40% of children born to alcoholic mothers show a distinctive profile of anatomical, physiological, and behavioral impairments known as fetal alcohol syndrome. And this is... I told you before, uh, individuals that, that uh, drink too much alcohol during their pregnancy, uh, as you can see, the brain is not nearly as complex. Uh, and the baby with FAS on the right, uh, it's not as large. And these are some of the things that you can do to your own child. Uh, children suffering from FAS show stunted growth and select facial uh, anomalies. Small brain, as we saw before. Small eye sockets, uh, flat mid face, indistinct philtrum, and this is the philtrum. This is the philtrum here. Uh, and if you look at somebody, <laughs> they will have uh, a crease uh, from their the bottom of their nose to their upper lip. Uh, small chin, thin upper lip, uh, short nose, lowered ears, low nasal bridge, uh, epicanthal fold on the eyelids. Epicanthal fold is a a uh, a uh, <laughs> collection of fat underneath the eyelids. Brain impairment is due to their small brain and brain structure problems, like the almost absent corpus callosum. This is a baby. This is what a normal corpus callosum looks like, as you can see. This is a baby with uh, with fetal alcohol syndrome. It's, a, it's almost not there at all. The corpus callosum is a connection between the two hemispheres, the left and right hemispheres of the brain. Uh, normally, this is uh, fairly extensive. Um, this is a, actually a male brain. Males uh, have a smaller cor corpus callosum than females do. Uh, females uh, have 11% larger corpus callosum. And this, you can tell because of the mass, that this is actually a male brain. Um, reduction of cerebral cortical gyri, as we saw before, and we can see it again. Uh, they're not as complex. The brain is, the, this is where all of your intellectual capability comes from, uh, from the uh, cerebral cortex. And you can see how complex this one is and how not complex this, this one is. Uh, intellectual disability can be mild to severe, possibly depending on the time during pregnancy and the level of consumption. Uh, besides intellectual disability, children with FAS also show such neurological abnormalities such as hyperactivity, irritability, and tremulousness. This is another uh, reason for the uh, individuals to be uh, diagnosed with ADHD. Studies also seem to indicate that marijuana may have the same effects as alcohol. So, not safe. Autism spectrum disorder is a lifelong developmental disorder that is characterized by slight to severe social impairment in language. 70% of the children with ASD uh, develop poor language skills, rarely getting beyond monosyllabic syllabic, uh, responses and echolalia. Uh, Autism spectrum disorder doesn't have to correspond with any mental deficiency. 
but the lack of social interaction may impair the diagnosis, and that's one of the reasons that's how we diagnose ASD. Now, I'll have to tell you, uh, I've been teaching psychology, I've been studying psychology since the 1970s. And when I first started teaching psychology and, uh, and I took uh, abnormal psychology, uh, the textbook uh, that we were using uh, said that 70% of children with ASD were mute. They couldn't speak at all. But we have developed techniques for training and uh, education uh, for uh, individuals suffering from uh, autism spectrum disorder. And uh, this has improved markedly uh, since even 30 years ago uh, because of uh, some of the work that is being done by psychologists and developmental uh, physicians. Uh, so this is one of the successes of uh, psychology and uh, medicine is uh, uh, how uh, children with uh, uh, autism spectrum disorder are recovering from their problems. Normally, when an individual meets a stranger, they scan their faces for recognition and potentially put this information in their long-term memory. However, individuals with autism show brain scans where they seek no recognition and therefore have a difficult time making new acquaintances. And this is the problem with autism spectrum disorder. Autism spectrum disorder seems to have something to do with brain organization. Uh, particularly, all the information is organized differently from a normal control. Uh, autism spectrum disorder seems to affect from one to two children per thousand it is far more common among male children than female children and seems to run in families. Various areas of the brain show abnormalities among autism spectrum disorder uh, suffering children, including the corpus callosum. Uh, autism spectrum disorder, formerly called Asperger's syndrome, seems to be a less severe form of autism spectrum disorder, where the individual does not suffer from language deficits but has problems with social interactions. As people age, there seems to be a steady decline in brain size that begins as early as the 30s and begins to accelerate after age 45. Now, I'm, I'm, not, I'm trying not to cry here because I'm 75 years old. <laughs> well, I'm in my 75th year. I'll be 75 in October. However, the degree of decline seems to vary from individual to individual, from barely evident to exaggerated. And I'm hoping mine is barely evident. Yet brain expansion seems to continue to occur, as is evidenced by the presence of growth cones in the frontal lobe, even in the oldest individual. And I'm reaching my uh, being one of the oldest of the old uh, very rapidly. Uh, as an individual enters their fifth decade, their hippocampal formation begins to shrink. Uh, this supratemporal gyrus also uh, loses volume. In fact, most areas of the brain begin to lose volume. Oh, oh my goodness. I can feel it moving around in there, that little bitty pea brain of mine. Uh, over 4 million uh, Americans suffer from Alzheimer's disease. Obviously, I don't have that yet. Uh, oddly, the possibility of developing symptoms of Alzheimer's disease uh, increases uh, with uh, age until the age of 85, and then it starts to decline for those people who have never developed symptoms, and that's what I'm hoping for right now. But uh, my sister is complaining about having memory problems. Uh, she's uh, she was born in 48, so she's a year. She's actually 75. She just turned 76 in, in February. She was born February 2nd. Alzheimer's disease starts as, a, as memory loss, but progresses into greater and greater cognitive function decline until the individual can no longer carry on a conversation. Alzheimer's is accompanied by a marked cortical atrophy, especially in the frontal, temporal, and parietal areas. The brains of Alzheimer's patients show degeneration of axon terminals and dendrites caused by the buildup of beta amyloid forming senile plaque. Amyloid precursor protein is bound by two enzymes, beta secretase and presenilin. If one of these enzymes mutates, amyloid plaque will build up. And this is what amyloid plaque looks like. It looks like ew, black stuff in there, and it actually does form 
uh, a very dark uh, substance because they're non-functional. Uh, some cells uh, show abnormalities called neurofibrillary tangles. Uh, these are tangles of the neurofilament that produced uh, in abundance in the presence of protein tau. Another gene mutation uh, may allow Alzheimer's disease, APOE4, is, suppo is supposed to break down the amyloid plaque, but is less efficient than APOE2 or APOE3 versions. And I'm hoping I'm an APOE2 or APOE3 so that uh, I don't develop Alzheimer's disease. With both amyloid plaque and neurofibrillary tangles clogging the form of functional uh, neurons of the brain, the basal forebrain nuclei die, the cells uh, that produce acetylcholine, and the memory function of the brain dies with it. And I'm going to show you what people with Alzheimer's disease look like. Maybe. memory I think is good. I right. think it's good. But I mean I know the telephone numbers and my call and everything else. But sometimes it gets blurry. My memory? I think it's pretty good. But important things I don't s seem to remember. Hmm. If I could I would be in, out of college. I was in denial about how bad the Alzheimer's was. But I saw it progressing. It was getting worse. He was sleeping more and more. Um, he was he was just like out of it sometimes. My dad was able to do everything, and now he's he's not he's able to barely care for himself. William and Harvey are just two of the 5.3 million people in the United States living with Alzheimer's disease, mm -hmm. according to the Alzheimer's Association and a new case is diagnosed every 70 seconds. Alzheimer's disease is what we call a progressive neurodegenerative disease. And that's just a fancy way of saying that cells in the brain or neurons are dying because of the disease process. While no one really knows what causes Alzheimer's, some of the signs include impaired memory, restlessness, language deterioration, emotional apathy, impaired behavior, and confusion. And the family is great. We had two sons, and one was a PhD, and I can't remember the other one. My father, he used to own a gin mill, then he went into the butcher shop business, and he also delivered beer and soda around town and people working for him. It was an interesting life. He made it interesting, so did my mother. And they're still both around, too. And I'm 92 years old. How about that? If memory changes lead to real functional problems, people are not recognizing people that they've known for years, people are forgetting how to get to places they've gone to for years, or people just aren't able to remember things that they used to be able to remember to the point that it's affecting their ability to live their life, to carry out their daily tasks, that's when it's time to seek the help of a professional. This way. That's when Linda decided she needed some assistance. People would come to the house and he would just let them in. Strangers, perfect strangers, he would let into the house. And they would stay for hours. And I would worry that they'd be walking around my house, uh, you know, checking it out for later or possibly taking things. Or I didn't know, he was signing contracts for services that we didn't need. Now Linda takes Harvey to a special day center for Alzheimer's patients where he spends time with his new friend William and a dozen other patients. Both men are living more stimulating lives as the day center helps them to adjust to their future. Ta -da. Okay. <clears throat> there you go. There we'll do it. Well, I'll show you what Alzheimer's looks like. Maybe. There we go. Drinking coffee every day didn't work for me, but I couldn't figure out why until I went from 184 There we go. Uh -huh. 
The human brain is a remarkable organ. Complex chemical and electrical processes take place within our brains that let us speak, move, see, remember, feel emotions, and make decisions. Inside a normal, healthy brain, billions of cells called neurons constantly communicate with one another. They receive messages from each other as electrical charges travel down the axon to the end of the neuron. The electrical charges release chemical messengers called neurotransmitters. The transmitters move across microscopic gaps or synapses between neurons. They bind to receptor sites on the dendrites of the next neuron. This cellular circuitry enables communication within the brain. Healthy neurotransmission is important for the brain to function well. Alzheimer's disease disrupts this intricate interplay. By compromising the ability of neurons to communicate with one another, the disease over time destroys memory and thinking skills. Scientific research has revealed some of the brain changes that take place in Alzheimer's disease. Abnormal structures called beta amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles are classic biological hallmarks of the disease. Plaques form when specific proteins in the neuron's cell membrane are processed differently. Normally, an enzyme called alpha-secretase SNPs amyloid precursor protein, or APP, releasing a fragment. A second enzyme, gamma-secretase, also SNPs APP in another place. These released fragments are thought to benefit neurons. In Alzheimer's disease, the first cut is made most often by another enzyme, beta-secretase. That, combined with the cut made by gamma-secretase, results in the release of short fragments of APP called beta-amyloid. When these fragments clump together, they become toxic and interfere with the function of neurons. As more fragments are added, these oligomers increase in size and become insoluble, eventually forming beta-amyloid plaques. Neurofibrillary tangles are made when a protein called tau is modified. In normal brain cells, tau stabilizes structures critical to the cell's internal transport system. Nutrients and other cellular cargo are carried up and down the structures called microtubules to all parts of the neuron. In Alzheimer's disease, abnormal tau separates from the microtubules, causing them to fall apart. Strands of this tau combine to form tangles inside the neuron, disabling the transport system and destroying the cell. Neurons in certain brain regions disconnect from each other and eventually die, causing memory loss. As these processes continue, the brain shrinks and loses function. We now know a great deal about changes that take place in the brain with Alzheimer's disease, but there is still much to learn. What other changes are taking place in the aging brain and its cells? And what influence do other diseases, genetics, and lifestyle factors have on the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease as the brain and body age? Scientific research is helping to unravel the mystery of Alzheimer's and related brain disorders. As we learn more, researchers move ever closer to discovering ways to treat and ultimately prevent this devastating fatal disease. Okay. <clears throat> I have, uh, as a laboratory technician, one of my jobs was uh, assisting with autopsies, and I have done an autopsy on an individual suffering from, uh, uh, suffering from Alzheimer's disease. And I can tell you that the uh, brain was markedly smaller of the individual uh, suffering from Alzheimer's disease. <sighs> I worked for a pathologist that took, always took the brain out. Ugh, that was not fun. <laughs> that's the way it works. And that's the end of the chapter. So we'll talk about something else next week, uh, something maybe more pleasant. So there you go. Talk to you next week.